No, not really. Video's finished. Thanks for coming out, fellas. But being real now, there's been some weird chatter about Haaland this season. Of course, the most high profile of it all came after a frustrating match against Arsenal for Haaland, in which Roy Keane said, quote, the levels of his general play are so poor, and not just today, but in general. In terms of in front of goal, he's best in the world, but his general play is so poor. He's almost like a League Two player. That is the way I look at him. His general play has to improve. It will do over the next few years. Being this brilliant striker is fantastic, but he has to improve his all-round game. Now, this quote has been interpreted on both ends of the spectrum. Some say, ah, it was fine. He's just being hyperbolic to get his point across. While others say that it's ridiculous and disrespectful. I say he has a weird obsession with the Holland family, personally, but at least Roy Keane promoted his opinion of Holland to a League One striker later on, eh? He's moving up. But that aside, it's all been part of the storm of criticism that has followed Haaland in his sophomore season at Manchester City. So let's break it all down. His output this season versus last, his underlying stats and where they have improved or regressed, is there really a reliance on Kevin De Bruyne and why certain expectations that have been hoisted upon him may never be met? Let's quickly go over how this season compares to last season. Last season was always going to be tough to beat. Moving to a new country in competition, winning a treble, and managing to score 52 goals in 53 matches while setting up nine on the go as well. That is tough to beat, right? On top of that, he had a relatively clean bill of health. He missed two matches with a bruised foot and another due to a groin problem in late March, early April. So pretty solid. This season, however, Holland was out for almost two months, missing 12 matches in that stretch and missed a couple of matches in April with a muscle injury. So four 14 matches or so, a drastic increase from last season. All the same, Holland has managed to score 38 goals in 43 appearances with six assists. So he's on 49 goal contributions, so 12 short of last season. He's also had 10 fewer appearances. Still two more matches remaining in City season, however. Last season, he had six hat tricks. This season, he only has three. What an absolute scrub. He's very much on track to win the Golden Boot for the second season running, one of just five players to do so. But let's look at minutes. Last season, he played for 4,131 minutes. That's an average of 79 minutes per goal. This season, he's accumulated 3,565 minutes and is averaging 94 minutes per goal. A drop for sure, but also a drop in total minutes played by a long shot. With two matches remaining in Manchester City season, he will likely have eight matches fewer this season compared to last, 45 to 53. Assuming he plays the full 90 against West Ham and Man United, he could play another zero to a maximum of 210 minutes if the FA Cup final goes to extra time. With that said, how about his goals minus expected goals performance? As you guys know, this is to be taken relatively lightly, used mostly as a relative guide as to how a player is performing. You take the amount of goals that they have and subtract their expected goals to see if they are overperforming, finishing well, or underperforming, finishing poorly on their XG. Quick note, the data I have available to me via Opta is limited to the top five leagues and the Champions League, so no domestic cup data. Erling Haaland is actually underperforming on his XG for the first time in league play, and my data goes back to the 2019-20 season when he moved to Dortmund. Every other season, he has overperformed. This season, he has an XG of 28.5 in the EPL and has scored 27, so minus 1.5 there, underperforming. Same story in the Champions League as well, which is surprising. Seven expected goals and six goals scored, so minus 1.0. The only other time he has underperformed on his XG, again, with the data I have, was the 21-22 Champions League campaign with Borussia Dortmund, and that was negligible, honestly. He underperformed by just 0.3. Three goals scored from 3.3 expected. Now let's look at the funny myths or accusations that are hurled his way for fun. <laughs> he often scores multiple goals against quote unquote weaker sides and is then called a flat track bully. Something all prolific scorers are accused of, really. It's sort of a, a mark of quality. I've often found these accusations to be a bit funny because people forget how many other players have scored that many goals against certain clubs. You know, the best scorers always have their biggest goal hauls against weaker oppositions. This isn't anything new, really. Let's look at Cristiano Ronaldo. Of the teams he has scored the most against, 
he has more goals than appearances against Hitafe with 23 goals from 14 matches. Celta Vigo, 20 goals from 13 matches. Feel free to pause here. Lots of goals against big clubs like Atleti and Barca, but many more matches against them as well. His best ratios are against the weaker sides. Lewandowski's is a little more balanced as you can see, but more goals than appearances against Augsburg, 26 and 26 against Wolfsburg, more goals than appearances against Köln, equal against Freiburg, you get it. Man, was he ever the Dortmund Reaper though, eh? Absolute nightmare for them. <laughs> Lionel Messi, same sort of thing. I feel for Ibar and Rayo Vallecano, 18 and 20 goals against them in just 11 appearances, ouch. So yeah, point made, right? Holland is no different. Smaller sample size because the guy is 23 years old, but the team he scored the most against is RB Leipzig, 12 in eight appearances. Then Wolves, of course, seven and nine against Bayern is pretty decent. Six and five against United, six and two against Luton. So not so different from the elite scorers that we were looking at a second ago. The other thing that I've heard a few times is that he's nothing without Kevin De Bruyne, which isn't exactly true. Sure, he scores a lot more when he's around, but it's not like he's completely useless and not scoring goals when he isn't around. In fact, if you look at Haaland's Premier League goal record, he has scored 18 goals and assisted four times in 20 appearances where Kevin De Bruyne didn't feature. In the Champions League, De Bruyne didn't feature at all in the group stage this season and Haaland scored five goals in five matches. They played in two UCL knockout round matches together and De Bruyne scored, Haaland didn't. So I think this was just overblown as a way for people to say, haha, he is nothing without De Bruyne. Well, Haaland went through sort of a rough patch in August to mid-October. And even in saying that, the dude scored six goals in 11 matches. A slump only someone like him could suffer, you know? Only he could call that a slump. But it's not lost on me. It was the big chances that he was missing that was what people were pointing to as the issue. I totally understand that, and I'm sure Haaland himself wasn't happy about that but players should be allowed to have a little slump without their overall quality or past achievements being called into question, right? Which leads us into... He's kind of his own worst enemy in a sense. He set the bar incredibly high and built this expectation that anything other than an upward trajectory is a regression. As we went over already, his goals per minute rate is still almost at a goal per game. Pretty close. But some have lost sight of something in all of this. He still has 90 goals and 15 assists from just 96 matches for City. Those are phenom numbers. Those are generational numbers. The fact that he can get marked out of matches, as he was against Real Madrid, is often used against him and against Arsenal as well. As people want him to be a Messi or Ronaldo, someone who can single-handedly lift his entire squad no matter the opposition and win matches all on their own. But there are two things working against him here. The first being that the truth is, Messi and Ronaldo have moved along, and there's no guarantee that we will have another player like them ever, let alone two at the same time. Mbappe and Haaland are generational talents, make no mistake of that. But being a generational talent isn't enough to reach the levels that Messi and Ronaldo set. There are levels to everything, and trying to compare anyone to those players, their ability, and what they achieved both in output and in silverware is simply unfair to any modern player at the moment. Even the generational talents. They aren't at that level. Not yet, at least. And the second bit is that, in my opinion, unfortunately for Haaland, he's been misidentified by some people. They expect him to be more than what he has shown himself to be. An elite striker. A striker who will kill you if you let him run in behind, who will kill you with his movement in the box. But how many times have you seen him take on a team on his own, take on multiple players to score a goal or set up a teammate? I'm sure someone will comment with an exception, but... Don't do the Twitter thing and use the exception as the rule, and by extension, the expectation of him. That's not Haaland. He's a generational striker, not a generational all-round footballer that can do it all as some of his predecessors have. He's not as dynamic as R9 or Messi or CR7, and there's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't lessen him as a player. In speaking to Roger Bennett, Haaland himself has said, quote, My job isn't to be like Rodri, to control a game. It's being in the box and finishing the attacks. You can play football without touching the ball, even if it sounds funny for some to hear that. You can do it with movements, the mental part, and the awareness. That's my focus, and I don't care about what people say. It's focusing on helping the team win. If Haaland himself is aware of that, why are others demanding him to be more than what he needs to be? And we also have to remember, you can be a generational talent and still have limitations. So the criticism stems from people setting an unrealistic expectation on Haaland. But when it comes to being an absolute killer finisher around the goal, 
there isn't a striker who has matched his numbers in the past few seasons. He did it at Dortmund, he's done it at City, and if it was so easy to do in City's setup, why haven't players done so in his absence? The sooner we move away from comparing players to Messi and Ronaldo and stop with this, he's either the goat or he's trash kind of nonsense when speaking about guys like Mbappe and Haaland, the sooner we can just enjoy these guys for what they are. Ridiculous talents that would be hailed as such in any other generation, and not every ridiculous generational talent needs to be seen as the greatest of all time. Sometimes a good thing can just be that, a good thing. And if Haaland himself has said that he dreams of simply constantly improving, winning titles, and being the best Haaland, then he's on an incredible trajectory for a 23-year-old guy. That's it for this one, fellas. Just a quick one to chat about Haaland as we are starting to gear up for our Champions League final coverage here at Rubona TV, actually. And then the Euros are right around the corner. Thanks, as always, for joining me. I really appreciate it. If you're new here, why not subscribe? And other than that, I'll see you in the next video. Take care.